Amen. Let's crack on, shall we? So welcome to our online audience, our, our streaming audience. Let's say hi. Hi. So my message this morning, whether you're here or looking through the screen, is how to keep calm and carry on in the cost of living crisis. So I've got a series now. I've got a series. I only had one now, but now I've got a series. But I do think it's worth a message or two. Amen. As I'm sure you're all aware, we are living what the media describe as a cost of living crisis. Inflation was running in double figures there for a little while. It's still elevated. Gas, electricity prices have at least doubled. We're just about to come off our contract and onto a new tariff, which is going to more than double. Thankfully, the Lord's already provided for that. Mortgage interest rates have gone through the roof and still through the roof. Petrol prices have shot up because of the Ukraine war and they've remained high as well. Price of basic food items. Man, eggs, can you believe it? I'm just blown away by, by the prices. Travel and accommodation costs. Wow. And people really are out there in the world... No doubt us, we've had to also have a look at our budgets. We've had a look at, you know, kind of restructuring perhaps, looking at maybe a better mortgage rate when you've come to the end of your term, maybe developing another income stream, maybe getting on to comparethemarket.com. Go compare. <laughs> and, you know, we need to do that. It's just a part of stewardship um, to just... just be blasé about it. It's not good stewardship. Yeah, amen. We don't want to worry about it, but, but God expects us to be good stewards. So surely you've all done that, but that by itself won't keep you calm and allow you to carry on in this cost of living crisis. For us as believers, we need to hear again the words of Jesus. And I'm really just concentrating in this message just on a, a passage that he spoke about which underlines our worth and value to God. In short, that we're worth taking care of. And a lot of us kind of struggle with that. We do need to consider all these practical aspects, but God will enable us to keep calm and carry on as our faith is renewed. Amen? And particularly our faith renewed in our Father's love for us, our Father's value of us, that he sees us as worthy, and his willingness to take care of us out of that value and worth. Amen? Yeah. So how do we as Christians remain calm and collected in the midst of such a dramatic increase in the cost of living? Well, the first thing is this. We, we need to change our thinking if need be. I would say to you, don't think in terms of crisis. The world is having a crisis. But we are in the world, but not of it. And we're also in the kingdom of God. And our Father isn't broke. And He is willing and He is able to take care of His children. So if that's all you hear in this message, good. So we need to change our thinking. And, and sometimes to do that, you might need to disengage from the media. Those of you that join Sky News 24 and all that, you might need to cut it down to 23 hours rather than 24. Because if you allow all that to overwhelm you, particularly if you're not strong in the word, particularly if your prayer life isn't really in a place where it should be, you are going to feel overwhelmed. You will have worry and anxiety because you've joined the mindset of the world. Are you with me? I just want to tell you that through the Lord Jesus, our Father in heaven has got it all covered. Amen? Not just your sin. <laughs> he's got you covered. For every eventuality, every necessity, he's got you covered. Jesus has made a way for us to keep calm and carry on. Amen. So through our faith and Jesus' atoning blood, we've been adopted into the family of God. God's our dad. God's our father. 
Romans and Galatians tells us that our hearts cry, Abba, Father. That's the language of the nursery in those days. Papa, God. We need to bear in mind Jesus' words. He says, unless you become as little children, in terms of you believe in them, you won't enter into the kingdom of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? And we need to return to that place of asking ourselves, do I have that childlike trust? You see, our faith and belief in God as our Father, our Abba Father, will cause us to think differently. If you have faith in the Word of God, it will change your thinking. And some of us need to, I think, need to rewire our thinking by coming back to a place of faith. Are you with me? The basis for faith in God's provision is our faith in how much our Father loves us and values us. Would you agree? Let me say it again. The basis for faith in God's provision is our faith in how much He loves us and values us. Let me share the first scriptures with you. Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 31. Let's read this together. I hope it says the same as the Amplified Bible here. Let's go. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, what does he say? Worry a little bit? Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you're going to eat or about your body, what you will put on by way of clothing. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Now, how many of you think that as well as food and clothing, it might be accommodation, it might be transport, all the necessities of life, amen? So he says, life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn. And God feeds them. Now look at the next five words. Let's say them together. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit? That was from here to there, about 18 inches. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Anxious? Anxiety? Then he says, consider the lilies and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, that's King Solomon, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you? Another five words. O ye of little faith. There's a corollary here. The degree of anxiety and worry is a reflection on our faith level. Let's go on. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink. Nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you need these things. Your father knows you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Can everybody say amen? to that. Look at that phrase. Can we go back to the first part of that? Uh, thank you, Hannah. And it says, of how much more value are you than the birds? Verse 24. How do we know we're more value than the birds? How do you know deep, deep down that you are more value? If God's going to take care of the birds, how do you know that you're of much more value than the birds. How do we know how valuable we are to God? Well, 
how do you determine the value of anything? The value of anything, be it eBay or anywhere else, is the, on the price that people are prepared to pay for it. Amen? And the death of God's Son, the shedding of His blood on the cross, forever declares the value of you to God the Father. He died for you. Of how much value you were worth dying for. Amen? Amen? We really need to get that. The blood of Jesus fixes our value. As 1 Corinthians 6.20 and 7.23 says, you were bought for a price. Yeah? You were bought for a price. You were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That's, but so many of us battle with unworthiness. Uh -huh. we, we really struggle to get ahead around that. And therefore we end up in that place of anxiety and worry and oh ye of little faith. Hello? But God wants us to increase our faith. He wants to take us to that place where we are settled. Where we have an expectation that he will take care of us. Are you with me? So how real is that value to you? Are you struggling to believe it? Are we of little faith, therefore, feel of little worth in our own sight? Perhaps not worth taking care of. Jesus tells us to consider two things in this passage, and the second thing we'll have to wait till next time. I spent a lot of time in this passage over the years, and the truths are so simple but so profound. He says, first of all, to consider... The ravens. Can we put that first one up again, Hannah? In fact, can, before we do that, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm mucking you around. Can we show that little picture that I uploaded? Just in case there's no twitches in here and you don't know what a raven is. This is a raven. One of the biggest of the crow family. In fact, it is the biggest of the crow family. So does everybody know what a raven is? All right. Do all the Persians understand what a raven is? That's a raven. But Jesus tells us to consider it. And what does he say about it? He said, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They don't have a storehouse and they don't have a barn, but God feeds them. Ravens, unlike us, who can sow to reap and store up what we reap for the future... The ravens don't. The ravens can't. They live day to day, meal to meal, and God feeds them. The ravens, without really knowing it, the ravens depend on God's provision coming through every day because they've got no recourse to things in the ground. Hmm? They've got no recourse to a bank or a storehouse. We do. But there's a lesson to be learned here. In considering the ravens, the, the truth that we are to focus on and believe with all our hearts is that God is willing and has the ability to provide for all of our material needs in good time. Amen. Amen. And it's worth bearing in mind that God's, mid, God's midnight hour is often not synchronized with ours. God! It's due by this date! Lord, the mortgage payment! Jesus is right! It's time! <laughs> but he tells us, consider the ravens. Amen. Amen. The context here is God's provision for our material needs. He knows he created us with an ability to plan for the future, to think ahead. Amen? With a tendency to overthink ahead. Now, of course, we have to 
give due consideration to things like pension plans and investments for the long term. Of course we have to do that. But the, the lesson here is that if the next mortgage payment is, well, it's coming due and you only have half of it, despite your best efforts, or, or the rent is due, or the car payment's due, or something else is due, God's message is think like the raven. Have faith. He's coming through. And he'll come through every time. Be a bird brain. I don't know if you've ever been called a bird brain. But it's good to think like a bird sometimes. Do you agree? <laughs> Some of us desperately need to think like the raven. Because we overthink and overthink and overthink. And in that overthinking, there's room there for doubt and fear and fear of lack, fear of the future. Jesus' message here in considering the ravens is, okay, yeah, you guys can think about the future. Amen. You can have a storehouse. You can sow and reap and all the lessons that go into that. But in the here and the now, and what we need now to meet the next payment of anything, is let's think like the ravens. I learned this lesson, man, in the first two years of our married life. Julie and I, well, it was me actually, disobeyed the old rule in Genesis there to leave your father and mother and cleave to your wife. As a Scotsman, I thought, let's live with Julie's mother for six months and save up a deposit. And Julie's mother is a great lady and I uh, really honor her. But because we breached that, there's a little bit of tension sometimes. You hear what I'm saying? And then we decided, okay, let's move out. We rented for about six months and then we bought a house. We went into the bank manager's office. That's what you did in those days. You wore your best clothes. And my wife is sitting there six months pregnant. Obviously not going to be working. And we applied for this mortgage. We didn't quite have enough finance, so we took a bridging loan as well. And I'm working in a rubber factory for a hundred bucks a week. And the interest rates were over 10%. But we felt it was God. <laughs> And I was about to learn a few lessons about God's provision the hard way. Because having been brought up in poverty without a father, my faith in God's provision in terms of my father, heavenly father, supplying for me wasn't real strong. And unlike the mortgage we have now, which is paid out every, paid every month, Back then, mortgage payments in Australia were paid every quarter. How many know things can go wrong over a quarter? How many, can, how many know you can, as a young bloke with a lot of interests and family, you can lose sight of the next mortgage payment deadline? So there was a bit of that and a bit of, you know, lack of faith and a whole bunch of stuff. And I can honestly tell you, as far as I can remember, not once did we have the money for that mortgage payment <laughs> as it approached. Not what sometimes we were over a thousand dollars short, that the payment was two thousand bucks plus. Not once did we ever have that money. And Julie gave birth and, and, and has taken care of, uh, of, of Becky there, and, and we were down to one income. And every quarter, it felt like being tied to a big water wheel. You know how they used to, they used to judge a witch, you know? <laughs> you tie them to the water wheel and up and around. It felt, it felt like this every quarter, and it's like, oh. But you know, in the days and the weeks and sometimes the hours before that payment was made, God came through every single time. I remember one time the whole payment was given to us, 2,000 bucks plus. I remember one time having been into Melbourne there to get a wisdom tooth out and it hadn't gone right. I needed an oral surgeon and I wasn't in the best of moods. 
And I came home and I tried to open the front door. And there was something jamming the door. And there was, you know, there was some, something stuffed under the front door. And I'm shoving the door and it wouldn't open. I thought, like, who stuck that there? I've only been saved a couple of years, so give me a bit of grace. Anyway, I, I, I pull it out, and it's an envelope. And there's 1,500 bucks in that envelope. Somebody in the church had just felt led by God to shove it. Nobody else knew the situation we were in. And somebody had just put that under the door. I've already told you the story about the church, the, 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 the Connect Group member who, rem who asked me one Connect Group, Session, he said, uh, Rob, uh, have you found an envelope on your bedside table? And I said, I suddenly remembered how messy my bedroom table was. You could lose a car in there. And um, I said, uh, uh. <laughs> he says, yeah, just, uh, just check your bedside table. So I kind of rummaged through what was on top of it and I found the envelope. There's $3,000 in there. I tell you, every time God came through. But I'm still in this place. I, I, I still didn't get to that place each quarter of peace and quiet and calm. I was still nervous and anxious. I, I, something had to be broken in my thinking. Something I'd picked up from my, the, my family, the poverty that we'd been in. The, my father dying when I was two. I had to get past all that stuff. And man, it was a difficult lesson to learn. But you know, I think in five years, God increased our equity in that house to 50%. That's not bad for a young couple, is it? To have the house half paid off with 10% interest rates. Glory to God. Amen. I remember one time, it was getting really bad. Poverty mentality again. And I said, Julie, I've sold everything that can be sold <laughs> in the garage with this big metal steel garage. And then I had this brainwave. Let's sell the garage. <laughs> and my wife kind of just gently reminded me, well, where do you stop? <laughs> yeah, how far do you go? That's a good question. <laughs> We need to deal with the, the stuff of the past, don't we? So I drew a line in the sand. I thought, we're not selling anymore. We're going to believe God. And as I said before, by the time it came time for us to go to Scotland to pioneer a church, God had given us half the equity of that house. Isn't that amazing? So what are you going through? What payments are coming up? What's your attitude towards that? Are you... A bit like me in those days, are you still trying to work through some stuff in your head? The only way to do that is to pray to your Heavenly Father. Are you with me? Is to develop that relationship. So consider the ravens. Turn to somebody and say, Consider the ravens. Matthew adds one more. In Matthew's account, he adds another verse to it. Same, same story, but he adds a verse to it. He says, Matthew says this, So do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own. Sufficient for each day is its own trouble. So don't overthink tomorrow. Plan, is, plan for tomorrow. You know, look at your investments, pension plans, funeral plans, whatever. Take, of course we've got to take that in consideration. But we need to be like the ravens in the here and the now. And just trust God to come through. Because you're of more value than the birds. He didn't die for the birds. He didn't come in raven form. <laughs> he came in human form, Jesus. I, oh, there you went. On the subject of consider the ravens, there's another verse about birds that says the same truth, that states the same truth. Let's look at Luke chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. And 
It says this. Jesus speaking. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them. Everybody say not one of them. I mean, and I'll come back to that. And not one of them is forgotten. Only God can do that. Not one of them is forgotten or uncared for in the presence of God. Now, do you believe that or not? When you look in your bird table, when you pass the hedge, and you look at the sparrows, I think we better show a photo of a sparrow there, Hannah. Some people are wondering about what's a sparrow. That's a sparrow. The reason I put those two images up is to help you go through this time, these economic times, that you'll remind each other and say, what was that message that Rob preached and he projected a couple of pictures of sparrows and ravens? Then you'll be able to tell them, well, wasn't that the one about you're of more value? So have one last look at the sparrow and we will have a look at the deep truth about sparrows. Thank you, Hannah. Let's go back to the, the verse. It says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten or uncared for in the presence of God. So evidently, in the marketplace at that time, sparrows were relatively worthless. Five for tuppence. Do you remember what tuppence was? Two pennies, four half pennies, eight farthings. Man, we're showing a rage now, aren't we? How many people are pre-decimal? <laughs> so, in verse 6 here, Jesus is using the example of birds again. Not ravens, but sparrows. And he's saying here that not one of them is forgotten or uncared for in the presence of God. Friends, are you in the presence of God? <laughs> when you pray, when you do your devotions, and then you go to work, you're a Christian. Amen. You're not just in the presence of God here. You are in one sense, the corporate presence of God. But God goes with you when you leave here. You're always in the presence of God. You're always in his awareness is what he's really speaking about. God is aware of you. Amen. For good measure, do you know what I did? I went down a rabbit hole with this. And I thought, I wonder what the distribution of the common house sparrow is throughout the world. Is there a reason Jesus chose a sparrow in this instance? That when the Bible is translated from one ethnic group to the next ethnic group across the planet, everybody would know what he's talking about relative to the sparrow. Well, you can check it out for yourself. The sparrow is distributed right across the globe. In some countries introduced, like Australia. But in huge swathes of every continent, except the Antarctica. The sparrow is represented. <laughs> and why? So that we all can get this illustration. Amen. Thank God the sparrow is not an endangered species. Or we wouldn't know what he's talking about. It's the common sparrow. They might not be pretty, but I love them. Every time I hear their chatter, like yesterday, I walked up to the harbour with Julian. There's a little bush there, a you know, whole copse actually of um, bushes next to the Martello Tower. And the place is full of chatter. There were 30 sparrows in there. And I've been preparing my message and I thought, God, you know every single one of them. And you take care of them. And as God looks down to this place this morning, as God looks on, he's aware of you. Amen? And he knows what you need. By way of clothing. There's a, I've got a story about, I bought a suit, by the way. After, for the wedding, this was uh, another thing that I need constant correction on, but I'll have to leave it for next time because that comes in with consider the lilies, which is about 
quality and uh, using the example of clothing. So thank God for the sparrows. Now Jesus goes further than that, and I'll conclude with this. Jesus goes further than that in terms of making us aware of the detail that he sees and his awareness of our needs. He says, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Really? Yes. Who numbers them? God. Apparently, if you're blonde, you have 150,000 hairs on your head. If you're a brunette, you have 110,000 hairs on your head. If you're a redhead, you have 90,000 hairs on your head. And there are 8 billion people on this planet. <laughs> Multiply it by 100,000 at least. That's a lot of hair. And God says, they're all numbered. Someone might say, oh, I think you're taking that over literally. <laughs> I don't think so. Because he's also the God of the entire universe. And they're so excited right now by the findings of the James Webb Space Telescope about the billions of galaxies that hitherto have been invisible because of the sheer power of this telescope. And Christ, the Word of God, made them all. Create, created them ex nihilo. Nihilo, however you pronounce it. Out of nothing. Because he's God. So he most certainly knows how many hairs are on your head and everybody else's. Are you, are you seeing what he's trying to tell us? So if he's aware of the number of hairs in your head, 90,000 there, 110,000 there. I don't know, what, what about gray hair? For men, it's ever decreasing. <laughs> but friend, if he knows the numbers of your hairs, he knows the numbers of your bank account. He knows the numbers of your bank balance. Hello? He knows the numbers on the balance of your mortgage. He knows the numbers of your phone contract. He knows the numbers on the petrol pump and how much it costs. He knows! He, your father knows that you need these things. Amen? So let's be bird brains. Let's be like the ravens. We're humans. We plan for the future. Learn from the past. But let's learn that lesson. that If it looks like we don't have enough... There's always someone who does. And he will get it through to you. Because you're his child. And you're worth the death of his son. Because God loved the world so much. He gave his only begotten son. That he who believes in him should not perish, go to hell. But should have eternal life. Amen. Let's just put our heads down and meditate for a moment on these words of Jesus about your value, your worth. His words about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things taken together will be added to you. If he feeds the ravens, how much more? Will he feed you? If he knows the numbers of the hairs in your head, he knows your numbers relative to your finances. Father God, thank you for Jesus' words. And it just occurred to me then that those words were spoken before the cross. You had not, by your death and the shedding of your blood on that cross, declared the value of every human being to you. 
This was before the cross you said those words. How much more after the cross should we believe these words? Because their value and worth is shown forth in every drop of your blood at Calvary. Or God forgive us of our unbelief. Forgive us of our little faith. Cleanse us from these sins, Lord. And as you cleanse us from these sins, let our faith grow and grow and grow to where to all our unsaved family members and everyone else around us, we can be an island of calm and collected, of carrying on in the midst of a storm. So, Father, I pray that you, by the Holy Spirit, would just drive these truths home to our hearts, Lord. Help us build our faith. Help us think along the lines of the ravens and the sparrows. To trust you in the moment. To trust you that you will come through whatever bill we're facing. I really pray for that settling of our faith. For everyone in here who is looking at a, one of those panelled envelopes with the red letters on it. Marked private and confidential. I pray for peace to come. A peace, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I wonder if we could stand. I just want to pray the Lord's Prayer together. I want to pray. And we're going to stop for a little bit at that bit where it says, Give us this day, give us this day our daily bread. You ready? Let's pray. Our Father, just think about it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Slowly. Give us this day our daily bread. Now let's just park up here for a few moments and I want you all in your heart of hearts to tell him what you need. Amen. Your father knows that you need them but Jesus taught us to come and pray for these needs. Amen. What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? How much do you need for that mortgage payment? How much do you need for that invoice? How much do you need for the rental payment? Are you telling him? Father, I thank you. You're listening right now. You're actually more accurate in your knowledge of our needs than we are. I thank you that you're aware of every heart praying in this place this morning. Thank you for your care for us in your presence. Let's move on. Forgive us of our trespasses. And you might want to think about confessing unbelief and at the root of doubt and fear and anxiety and worry. I, I confess that a lot. I, I confess that a lot. Forgive, forgive us of our trespasses, Lord. As we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom. The power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen.
So as you walk out of that door, mm, you'll be right. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, you'll be right. You will be right. You will be right. You will be right. Amen. God bless you. Prayer meeting tonight at 6.30. Have a wonderful day.